record. Record. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming and welcome to the second day of the ABBH session. I'm gonna do the format like yesterday. It's like we have one and a half hour sessions, 30 minutes per presenters. After about, so usually about 20 minutes for the for the presenter. If you obviously you can go longer after about 25 minutes, I will give you a warning or kind of notice that there's like five minutes left in your time. Um, obviously, if you have done, if you're finished by by then, then that's kind of like mood. Let me just go to questions. Um, so we've got the first paper, um, Peter Wadley, um, Australian Big Business <coughs> Revisited. Um, Peter, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, does that give you a screen? I'm struggling to get a screen up for you. Uh, I have, I have, I've seen it. So I did see the, I did see it. But oh, come on. No, that's, I went the wrong way. Okay. Now, I'll get that. Don't worry. Uh, let's see. How are you doing with that? Uh, it looks as if you kind of like zoomed out extremely far because I basically see a black screen with a light, with a white bar in the middle. Okay, because I can see the screen here. Uh, yeah. What do I do, to be honest? Uh, could you unshare and share again, just to kind of see it's like that it, it sets there? Okay, so how do I do that? Uh, if you click on top of uh, the share screen, there should be like a green bar with a red st stop share button if you move the mouse or cursor. Okay. Yeah, and then hit again on Zoom, share screen, and pick the, the PDF slides uh, to kind of share that. So at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's like the, the green button, share screen. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that, looks, that looks good. You got it? Yeah, that looks fun. Okay, well, thanks for your patience. I just had to build a IT lab in 10 minutes in our front room with my wife. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm talking about Australian Big Business Revisited, and according to the theme of the conference, I'm going to try and stick with that. So we're looking at uh, new uh, images of uh, Australian business. My apologies to those of you who've already hear, heard it. I'm not sure how much better it is, but um, let me begin by highlighting um, an image that I will return to which is Vaughan Gibson's estate in uh, Melbourne, around about 1912, which is what I'm really interested in. And if you can look at this carefully, you see that we've got the workshops over here, we've got a uh, generating station, we've got mills. We have here a completely integrated plant that services the retailing that the company does, the, the retailing that it's famous for. Uh, my story here is that Vaughan Gibson's are very, very important in Australia and even more important in Melbourne, and they do deserve to appear in a company history of Australia. Okay, story here. Um, sources are really important. Historians depend upon them. Uh, I'm not sure that economists do. I have a rather cynical view that economists pull down the uh, local data sets off the shelves in the library and use them, or more likely they send a research student to look for them, and those are pre-packaged and available to all. So I'm saying that historians make a vital contribution because they look at sources. I'm gonna try and uh, explain some of the sources about Australia. There are two papers that this builds upon. Uh, it's building slowly, but it's getting there, I hope. And as I already said, um, this looks a bit like one that I tried to do before, um, but the outline, I wouldn't take the numbers too seriously, um, but we're looking at the preference and introduction uh, an introduction to historiography, then some discussions about the data sets uh, and uh, whether or not in the end these matter, whether the data sets reveal anything new and important. Uh, I will progress, so I'll try and get through it quickly. Um, the um, point about sources here is that uh, some of these are well thumbed and some of them are relatively neglected. Okay, so there are sources which uh, people have looked at and looked at uh, quite closely. And then there are some which, although they may be open or maybe although they may be uh, available, 
at least if you're in London for the most part, and some of them are in Australia, then these sources can play a vital role in changing the story about the emergence of Australian big business. I'm going to try and also mention as I go rules about data collection, uh, some uh, words about business activities, some um, comments about reference points, looking at 1912 and 1913 in particular. And then I'm going to say something about the enumeration of big business by business historians. The um, historiography, it depends very heavily on the work done by Simon Beale and David Merritt, and of course, Grant Fleming too. But uh, the article that was uh, reproduced in Business Institutions and Behaviour in Australia by Beale and Merritt is essential. I don't have a lunch if they haven't written this. And then that research feeds into the big end of town which I'm trying to look at in a different way. I'd say that there's an even uh, stronger justification for looking at this work because uh, the business histories feed into the Cambridge history of Australia and the Cambridge economic history of Australia. So I'm arguing that the business history has played a very important role in recent scholarship and Simon Veal, uh, David Merritt and Grant Fleming have their contribution there. So I'm not, uh, in any way gain saying that. I have adopted the rules as far as I can that um, Bill and Merritt uh, proposed, but they aren't overly explicit about those, but the rules are strictly speaking, firms have to be economically, mainly economically active in, Aust active in Australia. Today, I've had to cut the financial firms, I've got far too much to say, so financial firms are pushed to one side. But I would remind you that Australian banks are big, Australian banks, although there are just over a handful of them, they are significantly bigger than the average bank in America. In fact, they're bigger than about 95% of the banks in America. So Australian banks are large by international standards. I'm not going to talk about state enterprises, so you can absent the state railway systems from this story. And then at the beginning of the period that I'm looking at, British-based, mostly London-based firms are prominent. And here I need to highlight that I'm not uh, a keen fan of uh, uh, Mirror Wilkins Freestanding Company. The companies that I'm talking about are firmly grounded. And I'm going to prefer the term uh, imperial to uh, freestanding. I don't think that the Australian firms uh, exist outside the empire. They exist within the empire. And the businessmen who organise it, be they London or Sydney or Melbourne or any other combination of those cities and others, mainly in Australia, uh, they see the empire as crucial. So uh, imperial firms are going to figure. Um, many of the firms that are registered, uh, it, sorry, many of these firms are registered in Australia, but they have head offices in the United Kingdom. London's crucial. Um, Scotland, Edinburgh and Glasgow do play a role, but they're not important for the largest companies. Uh, I don't think freestanding is useful. Um, I think there's more in London going on than just a brass plate. Uh, I think that um, the annual shareholders meeting is really important here. Often uh, that's in London, so it could be in Sydney or Melbourne too. And the executive committee plays a role here. And the executive committee members often shuttled between uh, the United Kingdom and the Antipodes. And the argument then is that the people who are the actors here recognize a, a geographical jurisdiction that shares Britain and Australia. And it's very different from a, a model that we would impose from the late 20th century or early 21st century. So this is the kind of story that I'd tell about the identification of businessmen who see themselves as being British and being Australian. They don't see any contradiction there. They see that those terms in some ways are synonymous. We have to mention the problem here or the puzzle more, more likely, of multinational and multi-divisional status of firms. We've got the paradox that multinational firms, if these um, uh, imperial firms are uh, multinationals, which they are within the empire, then we have those companies before we have the multi-divisional structure. And it's worthwhile pointing out at this stage that uh, Chandler, who is the um, doyen of the um, multi-divisional company, the advocate, of its importance. Um, Chandler says 1920 is the crucial date, so you cannot look for multi-divisional companies to explain anything about entrepreneurial failure 
entrepreneurial failure in Britain or British entrepreneurial success in Australia or any other combination of those. Um, you could also argue that before the DuPont family adopt the M form, uh, other people have already had a stab at this, uh, the Kaiserreichs Thyssen, Germany, and the, uh, the British uh, Cooperative Wholesale Society. And when I'm at the Wholesale Society, I'll remind you that the uh, CWS has a keen interest and a role in Australia that shouldn't be forgotten. Okay, so there's this puzzle about the um, multi-divisional uh, company. And I'm going to argue today that Australia appears to be a pioneer. You could claim, I think, that it has one early uh, precocious multi-divisional company. And the reason why I say that is that if you look at the following criteria, uh, criteria it looks as though it, uh, it, it meets the bill. If you look at its organizational capacity, its hierarchical management structure, the way in which subordinate units are supervised by a central authority, and the control and the circumscribed capital that um, allocation that takes place in those uh, subsidiary divisions all suggest uh, a multi-divisional company. And the iconoclastic pioneer is Florian Gibson, another important uh, Australian company that um, disappeared from the story over the last 20 years. Okay, database, these are the kind of things that um, I'm including in my database, uh, the company name, the registration, the location of head office, the size of company by assets and liabilities, which are the same on the bottom line, they equal each other. I've also got data about market value uh, equity, sorry, equity market valuation. I haven't got time to do this. I've got some data about the workforce, the size of company by labor employed. I'm not gonna say anything about that today. Um, the database in this field is a bit messy, but nevertheless, it's not impossible to put data together for Australia. You must remember that if we're talking about the nature of activity, although it's easy to say our firm A matches criteria X, it's not true really with larger companies. Uh, you have companies that engage in a multiple of activities. And you can mention Dalgetty, um, but I'd say to highlight this, you could contrast retailing companies with significant manufacturing capacity, like Anthony Horden or Foy and Gibson, and manufacturing companies with significant retailing facilities, like McKay. So uh, an easy uh, dis discri discrimination between uh, firms by um, CIS is not really, sorry, by SICs, is not really as helpful as it might be. Okay, um, so we're dealing with um, companies that are, uh, are not financial. I'll remind you that, um, as I've already mentioned, total assets equals total liabilities. So if you're struggling to find the assets data, if you can find the liabilities data on the opposite side of the page, uh, then you are still dealing with uh, company size by, uh, by asset value. Um, I'll pass this slide over, but just point out that although Australia doesn't have a stock exchange in 1912, there is an Australian stock market, and I'd stress that market value, sorry, equity market valuations are viable, though I haven't got time to say anything about it. Why well, choose 1913-1912? Uh, 1930s unproblematic. It's chosen by Simon Veal and David Merritt, and I'll stick with that. There's not a great deal of change here. 1912 rather than 1910. It seems to me that the data, there's a lot more data and more useful data available for 1912 and 1910, makes 1912 sensible. But in addition to that, and strangely for an economic history story, uh, in Australasia, there's a lot going on in those two years in the period leading up to the First World War. That means 1912 is perhaps a, a better year for just before the First World War. Okay, um, I'll leave that up for the filming. So, sorry. Um, so you can get that comprehensive story and better picture. Um, now, turning to information that's available. Um, there's a, a, a range of data, but I want to stress the company balance sheets held at the Guildhall Library. Uh, the Guildhall Library has a fantastic collection of annual balance sheets. It was a condition that if you were quoted on the London Stock Exchange, 
you had to uh, provide each year your annual statement so that there is a, an amazing stock of uh, corporate data at the Guildhall Library. And John Armstrong, about 20 years ago, wrote a, an excellent article. The reference should be there, but uh, I didn't have time to pick it up this afternoon. Now, I'd like to stress this because I noticed in yesterday's paper, and I'll apologize to Claire that I didn't hear her paper. It was about four o'clock in the morning here, I think. Claire writes there's three primary phases of the development of company accounts uh, exist. From 1910 to 1950, annual reports were dry, unimaginative, and governed by statutory requirements to publish key financial indicators. Now that is in a sense true, but it's also untrue because companies provided the minimum, but they could and did often provide more than the statutory requirements. So, ah, sorry. Uh, apologies, I'm getting a warning that my battery is running out. And apart from the speed with which I'm talking, I'm not sure why that is the case. Um, I'll try and go on and then I'll get the, uh, that sorted out later. Um, so I think that uh, if you've taken that text on board, you can see just how detailed are the uh, reports of the uh, um, Broken Hill Proprietary Company, where they provide maps, diagrams, photographs, tables, and so on. Uh, the kind of reports that we have now are not unusual. They may not be the same, they may not have all the same data, but they're not unusual. Uh, stock exchange yearbooks are another source, and that's uh, a, an entry uh, taken from the investor's blue book, just to show you the kind of So it seems that Peter's battery uh, did run out. If I uh, kind of can infer that, like he dropped from the Zoom call. Um, okay, this is uh, first one ever happened. Um, so should we wait for a couple of minutes to see if he comes back, and then if not, we might. Uh, continue with, with the next paper and then give Peter uh, another 10 minutes to sort of finish at the end of the session. Um, like this is uh, like the, not particularly sure it's like how this is gonna be, uh, uh, yeah, how to proceed. So I'm curious, it's like the, has this ever happened? At, like, has anyone has seen this at, a, at another conference that like uh, a Zoom call just literally dropped in the middle of the presentation? Only when the presentation's going badly, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Might be engineered. <laughs> I remember, I was like, I've, I've seen it once happen at a conference where someone walked out on it on, the, on their presentation, as in presented, but then kind of like effectively cut short question time because it just didn't feel like this is not going to, like, I can't handle that now. This wasn't to... working for him. Yeah, it was, I mean, he would basically he looked like, when you saw it was like the yeah it is understandable kind of thing it's like he looked sick at a time but like it was it was uh i, I think the host is supposed to provide entertainment under these circumstances <laughs> <laughs> well we can be uh my, my first ever um presentation to a conference i rocked up to the it was one of the it wasn't a plenary session of course it was a a um what do you call it, consecutive session. And um, it was only me and the chair of the session that turned up. And I was yeah. put out because the chair insisted that I present the paper. Which <laughs> uh, I'm trying oh, to he's think. back. Okay, so Peter is joining back. At least he's showing up in the participant list. Again, Let's 
Mm -hmm. Cool. Yep, that looks that looks good. So we're seeing his screen. And uh, now we just need a voice. Hi. Peter? I'm here. Okay. Um, yeah, you haven't turned on your, you, like, I don't know whether you want to turn on your video camera or not. Um, if, if not, we can just do it like this. But like, if you want, then things like at the moment, we only see a screen, but we don't see your, um, your video, your picture. Can you see my... Um... We can see your screen. So if... Uh, trying to think how does, how does uh, the easiest way to do this is... Uh, we can see your screen. Okay, yeah. So we can see your so you should now see the the video button left lower corner of the Zoom screen, um, and it should basically be cut through. And so if you turn that on, um, yeah. Anyway, or oh, maybe yeah. just do you maybe just finish the presentation like this, and then um, go back to to video once you finish, um, and then we can. Can figure that out. Okay, Tony, can you see yeah. the screen that says Stock Exchange Yearbooks? Yes, you can see that screen. So, okay. so, so the point about that is there's a lot of data. Business historians have not really made the most of it. And they this data is really interesting and useful. All right, some things that we might say. There are other uh, sources like uh, newspapers, archives in Australia, and so on. Um, okay, we'll miss that. Simon knows all about that. He said it before. Um, using these other sources, in particular sources in Australia, we can pick up companies which are really important, which disappeared, like Holden, Foreign Gibson, Hoskins, uh, McKay, Sunshine Works, and then American subsidiaries, which are Australian companies, but owned by Americans, like Vacuum Oil and International Harvester. Okay. It turns out that Australian companies are bigger than we thought. Um, a lot bigger. Uh, they are in different places too. Uh, I compare here uh, the location of head offices, and I would highlight that number there. In 1912, nearly half of Australia's companies are uh, headquartered in London. So there is a difference if you construct a new 100 on the new data. Um, look at 1930. Uh, there isn't a great deal of change there relative to Simon and David's data. And uh, there isn't a great deal of change in terms of head office location. But what you can see here is that London is now a much less important uh, centre for Australian companies than it had been just before the First World War. OK, some conclusions. Um, historians follow sources. Uh, if you look at the sources, that are available, you can extend the picture of big business, you get these companies, which I think are really significant. I think there's a general point here, we should try and engage in replication studies more than we do. And I'm arguing that the Imperial Company is a different type of company. I think although it's a clumsy name, it actually describes more uh, usefully um, the development than does say freestanding company. Okay. Um, finally, I'll finish with Foyn Gibson, um, which is an integrated plant, and I'll call it a day there, and thank you for your tolerance and patience. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter. Um, maybe for questions, yeah, if you could stop sharing your screen and maybe turn on your video, that like, it might be easier to, to um, converse in that way. So if I stop sharing, yeah. yeah. Then you should see on your screen in the left lower corner a like a video button. Uh, I, I can see you because I've got two. No, stories. no, no. We can't see you. You can't see me. So you need to see. So uh, if, if you that, want. How's that? Uh, nope. Because it's uh, the Zoom shows your camera is turned off or it's not. not um, <sighs> Or if you want, we can probably do this this way as well. Just basically have a yeah, that looks better. Yes, now we we got you. Great. You were better off when there wasn't a picture. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, so questions. So we have got Simon uh, indicating that he wants to uh, question or respond. 
Uh, Simon, please. Sure, thanks. Um, Peter gave a, an early version of his paper a couple of, well, a couple of months ago, I think the Magic History Conference, where, where fortunately his uh, thing didn't disappear and so we had a bit more time to discuss it. I mean, they're just so, uh, it's really great that Peter's engaged with, with, this, with this topic. Um, certainly, there are doubtless errors in, in the sort of complex data. One of the frustrating things I find about working in Australian history is that you're often, you know, the only person doing the work. You know, I, the first half of my career was in Britain and Europe, and whatever you wrote about the people, other people working in. That's good in some ways because you can be a pioneer, but, but not so good in others. So it's great that Peter's there and Peter's sort of certainly identified, I'm sure, companies that we missed out in 1910. I should point out that the methodology of 1910 is a bit more complicated than what you've suggested there. Um, in the early presentation, Peter suggested that we hadn't covered finance companies, public companies, and our methodology was very brief. Uh, and all of those were not correct because they're all in the big end of town. We have got a separate list of financial companies. We do include public companies in the separate list as well, which is one of the reasons we use assets rather than market capitalization. The methodology is a whole chapter on that. So I don't think anybody can say there's anything wrong with that. A lot of Peter's focus now on this paper, as far as I can see, seems to be about the nature of freestanding companies. And I agree, I agree with him entirely about the complexity of freestanding companies. David and I have just completed another book on the history of multinational Australia before 1914. Pierre is doing a lot of work trying to calculate paid up capital from firms before 1914. Freestanding companies are a lot more complicated than Mira Wilkins suggested, if that, though I don't think Mira ever suggested anything as simple, just a lot of great complexity. Um, and we're finding that as that very much the case now. So we've spent years trying to put together a list of uh, multinational before 1940. It's very complicated. David and I probably don't agree on all the companies on that list. And I know for sure that Pierre doesn't agree with all the companies on our list and we don't agree with all the companies on his list. So whatever, uh, Peter, you find for 1910, there will be, you know, discussion and debate about whether we agree with your companies or not. Just about a couple of other quick points. Foy Gibson, David, in his modesty, is probably not going to point out that he co-authored an article uh, which looked at the hostile takeover of Floyd Gibson after the Second World War, and I think they're a very badly managed company. So I'm not sure that they should be put up as an example of a multi-divisional firm. Um, and uh, I should probably stop there. Oh, just one other thing, market capitalization versus assets as ways of measuring large-scale enterprise. That debate has been going on forever. Some of the reasons that we chose assets rather than market capitalization include thin trade share markets, the volatility of market capitalization is using single base years uh, and uh, the fact that this also enabled us to compare with public companies. But, you know, that's open debate. Some people have used market capitalization. And believe me, calculating it by market capitalization is a lot easier than doing it by assets. So we certainly didn't do it for simplicity. Anyhow, I know time's moving on, so I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Peter, do you want to respond in some way or should we go? See if there are other questions. Um, yeah, let's see if there's some more questions. Thank you to Simon and thank you to Claire, who's very generous. Yep. Um, anyone else? So either put your hand up in terms of the the on Zoom or basically turn on your video and let me know and I'll 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 see you. See so if I may. So you kind of highlighted a little bit when kind of like at one point you gave a point of saying like that you thought like your data set shows that companies are somewhat larger. Um, in general, what do you think is like the, what do you think are the consequences? Like in sense when you build your data set, it's like, what do you think is like leads to a revision or kind of like, what do we need to know about kind of like Australia business or businesses in Australia that might be revised based on basically the differences in the data sets that you kind of find? Okay, well, I think you have to have a view that the period before the First World War was worth looking at. We shouldn't let everything now determine the way in which we view the past. And the point about the data set is that we end up with a top 100 in Australia, which is significantly larger than Simon and David have reported. Uh, the largest company is nearly three times, sorry, the hundredth company is nearly three times as large as the data set that they presented. Uh, the average is, is much larger. So we have a significantly uh, larger group of companies. We also have more British companies. It's more British in nature. But as I say, I don't think Australians regard themselves as 
Australians are not British, they see themselves as both. I think the type of company, I haven't had time to do that today, uh, it also comes out differently. What's really significant are the mining companies. And that was the point at which I lost my PC earlier. Mm. But the uh, story that Claire's telling about the annual reports is, I think, unfortunately misleading. It depends on the companies that are being reported. If you look at plantation companies, plantation companies are important in Australia, though they're not necessarily rubber plantations, they do other things. And if you look at the mining companies, you find uh, really interesting reports that tell you a great deal about performance, about growth, about productivity. And the reports have all the data there. So it's well worth, if you have a student who's interested in mining, sending them to London, and getting to them to look at the mining companies. Because for example, uh, the BHP's report is 56 pages long. It's got photos, maps, diagrams. What more would you want? The one thing that's different now is that they are in color. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, anyone else? Another question? No. So one, one, unless Simon wants to do another one or is this just, you just kept your hand to your, your okay. Um, yeah, just one simple thing. Well, I disagree yep. fundamentally, Peter. I don't think Australians and British were considered themselves homogenous by this time. It's all there in the archives, the views of Jeff Jones, Mira Wilkins, many other people. Certainly some of them regarded, Australia, British entrepreneurs regarded the imperial markets as a bit of a soft option. Uh, but as Jeff Jones has pointed out, that's clearly not the case. And you look at the, the legislation on competition, and there's so much else. They're, they're not the same. They're really not. They, they see things differently. I don't think they're the same. I think they belong to the same society. It's a, a global society. And unfortunately, one of the things that I've had to cut is a fantastic report, which is very short. And the key thing about the company reporting case is that at the end, the chairman makes a statement about, and we're all British together. This is a meeting in Melbourne. And the report then continues. Everybody stood, cheered, and saying, God save the king. So I'm afraid that I do see that the Australians are as British as my great grandparents. My great grandparents are living in Yorkshire. The Australians are living in Melbourne, Sydney and elsewhere. But they identify with many of the same objectives politically and they share a lot of the economic assumptions. Okay, cool. So I think that's, I think a good, good end point um, thing. Uh, thank you, Peter, for um, your presentation. Um, the paper, and I think this is probably seems like a debate that might be ongoing for quite a little <laughs> bit uh, going forward. Uh, well, thank you, Florian. I could tell you the uh, aspirins that you've got down there, the stress of changing a battery on a PC, which yeah. I've had to borrow, has proved far too much for me. <laughs> so thank you, and I've enjoyed this one. Cool. Thank you. And uh, well, given that you're in Britain, uh, I hope we you can sleep well after that. <laughs> Um, cool. So let's go to the next paper uh, with Leif Davis um, on corporate adventuring in the 19th century New South Wales coastal, I think it's coastal timber trade. So my God, the, there's like this one little word that I always forget. My apologies to Leif. Um, thank you very much. And so Leif, the floor is yours. So again, thanks like the try about 20 minutes. If you go over that around 25 minutes, I will give you a note about we're hitting five minutes to the end. Thank you. Uh, Leif, you are currently still muted. Now, thank you, everybody. And I'll just, I'll share. And my, my name's Leif Davis. So I haven't met some of you, but I did, I did present at the 2018 conference in Hobart and enjoyed it very much. I, I live on Gunnai Kurnai country at Churchill, just on the edge of the Streslecki Ranges, which is a pretty good place to be. I recently completed my PhD at Western Sydney. It was an environmental history of the South Coast timber industry. I'm now happily chasing down all the rabbit burrows I had to ignore while I was finishing my thesis. And this paper is the first in the, my exploration of the coastal sailing fleet of the 19th century. This area has only become possible with trove and the digitization of of the newspapers and I'm, I'll go to share screen. Well, 
that's not what I wanted at all. I'm sorry. Um, ah, there we go. Here we go. Yep. Yep, there we go. Full screen slideshow. Yep. I'm new at this. I'm sorry. So if you click on the slide. Play from it. start. Yeah. Yeah. Play from start. There we go. Right. Thank you. So, so, my thesis traced the environmental history of the South Coast forest industry through four case studies that spanned most of the 200 years since the first cedar getters arrived on the coast. One of these case studies ch charted the story of a Sydney building supplies firm, Goodlett and Smith, who were active in the timber industry on the South Coast over a 30 year period from 1863 to 1893, corresponding with the Sydney construction boom. The coastal timber industry began to develop in earnest in the 1860s to supply the burgeoning Sydney construction industry as small sawmills were established as isolated communities along the coast. One of the first of these was at Jervis Bay, when George Dent, a timber merchant of Sydney, established himself on Currambine Creek, which flows into Jervis Bay in mid-1861. He had two saw pits immediately dug on the bank of the creek, and by the end of the year had sent sawn timber, hewn slabs, and 35 logs to Sydney, so he didn't muck around. By 1864, Goodlett and Smith also had employees and plant at Jervis Bay. There was a press report of an accident to the driver in the employ of Goodlett and Smith, who was driving the heavy timber carriage and five horses along the road between Tomerill, which was the local source of ironbark timber, and Currambine Creek. This and this information was gleaned from newspaper reports and unknown until Trove and the digitisation of newspapers. The Sydney building supplies firm of Goodlett and Smith was founded in 1855. It operated for over a century and was incorporated in 1890 to become Goodlett and Smith Limited. In its later years, it focused on its brickworks at Granville in the Sydney western suburbs. John Hay Goodlett was the founder of the company. He was a Scottish boy. He was a Scottish boy. He migrated to Australia in 1852 at the age of 18. Likely almost as soon as word of the 1851 gold rush reached his merchant family in Sydney in Scotland. As he established his Sydney firm, he developed a wide range of interests in building supplies and materials, and he was an early exponent of vertical integration. He established a sawmill at his Sydney premises in the late 1850s, which he moved to new premises in 1874. And here it is. And I hope that you can see this beautiful photograph from, from the City of Sydney archives, and it shows the scale of their operations. The logs that are floating in the harbour are cedar from the north coast. And I hope you can also see the boys over in the over in the left centre taking advantage of their makeshift raft to go skinny dipping in the harbour. And uh, up in up in the corner you'll see a two-story building. That was the sawmill. Uh, one floor was the sawmill. The other floor was the joinery section. And the and also you'll see a a, a vessel moored. The, it's the Ketch Esther Maria, which uh, Goodlett bought in 1868 to carry timber from the South Coast operations. And she continued to do that till 1880 when she was in a collision and, and, and lost with a, with a steamer just off Jervis Bay. So documented and archival, archival evidence has been available of Goodlett and Smith's building supplies activities and of John and Anne Goodlett's extensive Christian philanthropic activities. However, until recently, there's been very little information concerning their coastal timber getting activities. The establishment at Jervis Bay was one of the earliest timber getting enterprises south of the Shoalhaven River, and it was one of the first of the South Coast sawmills. These communities were entirely dependent on sea transport 
as late as 1919, it was reported that all townships and districts south of Nara were absolutely dependent upon the coastal steamers by that time for their means of communication, as were many places on the North Coast. Similarly to the cargo mills of the American Northwest at the time, the coastal sawmills had very limited or no local markets and virtually all their output went to Sydney. In 1866, it was reported that there were 150 vessels in the New South Wales coastal timber trade with a workforce of 6,000 ships owners and crews servicing the North and South Coast timber industries. And hang on just a sec. Sorry, sorry. There we go. Uh, this, ta this table gives, uh, even though it's um, World War, the World War, it's World War I, it gives some indication of the relative importance of timber in the coastal cargo trade. And um, I've made a note there, wool is very tiny, but it, wool was mainly grown inland and it most would have been shipped by rail. So that's not an indication of the relative importance of wooden timber overall. Although steamships were very well established on the New South Wales coast by the 1850s, sailing vessels continued to take bulk cargoes such as timber for many years to come. This pattern of adoption of steam in Australian coastal shipping was similar to the rest of the world. Despite the steady introduction of steamships worldwide, the great Days of sail lay not before but after the middle of the century from Graham, whose seminal article in 1956 looked at the sail versus steam. It took several decades and engineering advances before steamships were in general use for bulk cargoes. And this is a quote from Graham. The it was the adaptation of the high pressure triple expansion engine marked the end of an epoch, the epoch of a trading empire that for the greater part of the 19th century had conducted the bulk of its commercial business by sail. Steamers were very useful for carrying passengers, mail and relatively low volume, high value products such as cheese and butter. But sailing vessels were much cheaper to run with much larger hull capacity and were preferred for bulky cargoes with less time constraints. Up into the 20th century, almost all timber produced on the South Australian southeastern coast was carried to market in the capital cities by sailing vessels. And here's one. Here's a, um, before the age of photography, shipbuilders commissioned paintings such as this of their completed projects. The settings were fanciful, but the vessels were depicted in fastidious detail. This was a topsail schooner built in 1876 to carry timber and very typical of the coastal sailing fleet. And if you notice down the bottom, it was built by E. Davis at Brisbane Water. Well, he was actually my great great grandfather, I found out later. The catches and schooners typical of the coastal trade were the semi-trailers of the trade, sturdy and best versatile little vessels that could poke their noses into almost any bay or inlet and could be worked without wharves and jetties. Ronald Parsons wrote this about the South Australian coastal trade, but it applied equally all around the eastern coast. Very little documented evidence has survived of the activities of the Australian coastal sailing fleet. Bark, John Barks and a Maritime History of Australia has a chapter on New South Wales interstate shipping 1860 to 1914, which only recounts the history of the two major steamship companies of the North and South Coast. Barry Pemberton's Australian Coastal Shipping, 1979, detailed the difficulties of tracing the activities of the sailing fleet, which he dismissed as impracticable in a book of this nature and continue and then proceeded to ignore it. In 2009, as we know, the Li National Library developed Trove and searchable digitized newspapers. 
The Sydney Morning Herald had since its inception in 1840 published daily shipping news, including sections for coasters inward and outward, and this continued until 1886. The coasters inward section included details of the port the vessel had come from and details of the cargo. Searching for coasters inward Jervis Bay brought up an exhaustive list of entries, which I was able to collate to produce this table. And I'll put it up. I know there's a lot of detail there, but that's by year from 1861 to 1886. And it's timber, logs and other. So the other is fencing, beams, paling, shingles. Yeah. And it details the scale of extract, timber extraction by Good, Goodlett and Smith, and to a lesser extent, the Dent family between the early 1860s and 1886 when publication of the data ceased. And the, the notable one uh, in, in the totals, the notable, uh, this is the first column. You can see there's a, a the late, 80, the late 1860s, there's much more storm timber than any at any other time. And I think that must be, that was when, before Goodlett and Smith uh, bumped up their sawmilling in Sydney. And the other thing is the, the number, the logs that was set, the, the, in the mid 1870s, the logs that went out, the, the vast quantity of logs that went out and a total of nearly 10,000 logs and most of them in the mid-1870s. Mid and I'll skip the next one. Then um, an account by a visitor in 1871 reported that the edges of the shore were lined with hundreds of immense logs of splendid timber. And the local council at Jervis Bay recently constructed a walking track through the bush on the shore of the bay, which, which was beforehand inaccessible. And the remains of this giant came to light. And it, that, that doesn't show, there's a whole missing side of that. And it may have been felled a bit later than the 1880s, but it certainly shows the immense logs that grew around the bay and are simply no longer there. It's interesting to compare cargo shipped from Jervis Bay with those from Nelligan on the Clyde River over the same period. Whereas at Jervis Bay, there was a single large firm, on the Clyde, the industry was fragmented and fluid and numerous local participants who entered and left the market as their interests and fortunes waxed and waned. The port at Nelligan had been established in the 1850s to serve the gold fields of Araluan and Majors Creek. By the mid 1850s, a bullock track had been established down the Clyde Mountain from Braidwood and miners and supplies were transport, transshipped at Nelligan for the diggings. The first sawmills were established in the late 1860s. And this table, I will go to the next. This is from the Clyde River, and I'm sorry once again to try and get, this is, it's not very legible, but uh, the tape, but it shows that output from the Clyde River sawmills followed a different trajectory to Jervis Bay. At Jervis Bay, the peak of the sawn timber output occurred in the late 1860s. I think probably reflecting Goodlett and Smith's requirements, whereas at Nelligan, the peak of the sawn timber output spanned from the late 1870s to the mid 1880s, corresponding with the height of the Sydney building construction boom. A striking difference is in the number of logs sent, almost 10,000 from Jervis Bay, compared to 1,700 from Nelligan over the same period. Another difference is in the quantities of beams, girders and fencing timbers sent from Nelligan. Many of those beams and girders are still holding up public buildings in Sydney. They were hewn by axe from iron bar and fencing posts, rails and palings were split by axe. 
as in this famous painting by Tom Roberts. It's actually, it used to be known as the splitters, but now they've changed the name to the charcoal burners. The differences in output between Jervis Bay and Nelligan show much more value adding and labour input at Nelligan. Goodlett and Smith moved further down the coast to Redhead. Oh no. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, Microsoft has <laughs> Microsoft has absolutely decided I should sign in with a subscription on the iPad. Um, just a sec. Uh, I have to. Well, that that was the last slide. So um. You want to stop slides and finish without slides, or? Yeah. yeah yes. Yes. That might just be just stop sharing and then. Okay, I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, I, I, uh, yep. Okay. <laughs> cool. I can't believe that happened, but I've lost my paper now. Oh, here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And so I just have to read it, and it's not far to go. Yeah, here we go. Terribly sorry. No. But that was the slides anyway. Goodlett and Smith moved further down the coast to Redhead on the southern headland of Breck Bay in the mid-1870s where they had heard of a fine area of blackbutt timber. They established a sawmill and a school, but within eight years the timber had been cut out and they moved again to Kyola, a few kilometres north of Batemans Bay. At Kyola they built a horse-drawn tram to bring logs into the mill from the surrounding district. When the mill closed in 1893, the tramway had extended nine miles into the interior across the present day Princes Highway and a surveyor's report noted the scarcity of timber in the area. In 1893, as the depression took hold, the company had an anus horribilis. The company made a loss for the first time in its 40 year history their schooner Samoa was wrecked on the beach at Kyola in 1893, July 1893. And later in the year, one of the tubes in the sawmill boiler burst. Goodlett and Smith didn't replace the boiler. They closed the mill and left it idle. In 1900, they dismantled the sawmill. Much of the machinery, including the damaged boiler, they threw over the headland into the ocean. In their 40 years on the south coast, Goodlett and Smith didn't invest in land or initiate or encourage settlement at any of their three sites. Turrambeen Creek was settled by the Dent family and became the town of Huskisson. The sawmills at Redhead and Kyola were established on Crown special sawmill leases, which were surrendered, and all the machinery, plant, cottages and outbuildings were dismantled and removed when the timber resource was exhausted. The damaged boiler lying underwater where it was abandoned and has been documented by an ANU archaeology thesis is a final, but it's a final and perhaps appropriate relic of the 40 years that Goodlett and Smith spent on the south coast exploiting the forests as they moved southward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? So either uh, put your hand up in the chat or actually put it physically up so I can see it. And I'm happy to kind of like give you the, the floor. Um, oh, Lionel. Um, hi, Leith. Um, really nice paper and thank you. Um, I find the blend of environmental history and business history really interesting. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little more about what you're planning further down the track with your research. Oh, well, it's, uh, this was an initial thing sort of basically coming from my thesis, which probably shows the blend of environmental and but I'm looking at getting more into, I want, I want to do some work on the coastal 
and, and, and extend it all around this eastern coast. I, 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 um, Ronald Parsons did work on South Australia, but we now we now have from the newspapers there's this whole new source. So from here, I'll, I'll I, I basically want to focus on the coastal sailing, the timber, and probably mostly well, it was mostly timber. So and and so from here it's north coast, then then Victoria, and then Queensland. So and and then look look at the rise and fall of the sailing fleet and also follow the fate of some of those vessels you know that that, that one that i showed the acme um it was wrecked and sank on its first trip so <laughs> but it, it was caught in a gale off seal rocks and and there are so many reports in the newspaper and it just says never heard not heard of again lost at sea just the crews, the, they, they were just, they just disappeared. And it was accepted that that happened, you know. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking at getting further into it, you know, in, 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 in looking at the history of the coastal shipping. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Simon? Thanks. I won't ask the question about the railways because I can see Andre's got his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love I love stuff on coasting. In previous life, I sort of worked in the British coastal trade, and one of the great challenges ah. getting information because so much much of the trade is informal, so much is not picked up in the way that the overseas trade is by you know export duties and all those sorts of uh, issues. So in fact, it's very difficult to measure the volume of coastal trade, how much is at times by the distance. I think a better way of doing it, and I think you're sort of going down that route as well is by sort of trying to work out the number of ships that were in the trade at any one point, and we put up some stuff on that. A couple of questions, shipping registers. Uh, I missed the first couple of minutes of your talk, so if you said you've already looked at shipping registers, do they exist is one thing. The other thing is insurance, because um, you know the, the losses uh, of coastal trade are, of course, immense. I know that raises a whole series of other questions. Yes. <laughs> they had these uh, mutual insurance clubs because it was too expensive. And inappropriate to go to Lloyd's. So, so they had these mutual insurance clubs, and, and there's quite a bit of information in the UK about those clubs and the members of them. And I wonder whether there's something like that in Australia. Was how did they insure the vessels? And this way it's getting a bit more information about the capacity of the coastal trade. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Simon. That's a lot. That's some really useful areas to follow up because I'm in very, I'm in very early days of this. Yes. Thank you. Uh, then Andre. Hi, good morning, everyone. Coming to you very early from uh, the West over here. Oh, so uh, thanks for that, Leith. That was very good to listen to while I, you know, made my morning tea and uh, had my <laughs> breakfast. Good, good. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to offer the entertainment. Well, I just hope I didn't miss anything because um, I was sort of wondering to what extent was, did the timber industry have, I guess, you know, indirect government support through things like Harbour Works? Because... I know that uh, Wollongong and Kiama harbours are developed in the mid-19th century. What is it? Um, Belmont, ba Belmont Basin's uh, 1867, I think. Um, but I don't know about further south. And then, of course, you have the question of the railway, which doesn't reach uh, Bombardieri until 1893 and yeah. never gets further south despite no. plans to do so. Um, so, yeah, to what extent was there, you know, government activity to support the coastal shipping with harbour works and were they trying from an early stage to get some sort of railway extension down to the south coast to support this industry yeah occasionally there um i know there was a company you know 1904 or so the a jervis bay company that uh took a was got, got a concession for 20,000 acres, God help us. Um, and I forget what they were going to use it for, but it sounds disastrous. Mm. And they were working on an extension of the railway to Huskisson. So that, they, and, and 
And it would have been very appropriate if the railway had actually made it to Huskisson, given it's named after the um, the British <laughs> MP who died at the opening of the yes. Liverpool of Manchester. It was, down, it was hit by the steam steam engine. Yes, exactly. Huskisson, indeed. No, so that would have been appropriate, but no, it never got off the ground. So uh, every now and then there would be a deputation, you know, to to the local, but it never got uh, never got off the ground after. After Bomaderry, it's simply too difficult. There's mm. you know, between the rivers and the swamps, and so and and then and, and even past Jervis Bay, the country becomes very very wild. The escarpment comes to within a couple of miles of the coast. Mm. It's it sort of would be as expensive as Kiama. Yeah, and as difficult as getting down from again. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But Cheers. certainly the, the harbour works um, were Aladala, Aladala got harbour works and but um, well Huskisson had has one little public wharf which has never been <laughs> and that's it and that, that it has never been developed you know so the uh, but Aladala and Bateman's Bay, I think, and Naruma. Naruma had, you know, well, obviously in the 20th century it had extensive harbour works. So, but not not a lot, not a lot. And most of the timber, um, they call it, they they called them hole in the wall, holes in the wall. They mm. weren't ports, they were roadsteads. Yeah. They were just um that there'd be a there'd be a little headland that sheltered them from the south. And they would come and anchor in there. And I, I, uh, they, they, they'd anchor in the in the lee of the headland. And I know at Redhead, uh, the timber was winched out to the to the ship anchored the ship anchored off, and they winched out the slings of timber. And that was in the nineteen twenties. Oh, right. So, <laughs> colonial era, you've had very, very little development of harbour facilities yeah, yeah, at all. Yeah, very little, very little, yes. Thanks, Andre. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. That was great. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Liv, for the, the presentation. I oh, very much enjoyed it. Um, then, yeah, uh, we can go to uh, the third uh, presenter. Uh, we've got another a slightly different area uh, today in terms of like region. So we're moving from Australia to China. Uh, we've got Ling Yukong and uh, presenting on cultural identity facility board corporations, uh, uh, corporation business culture on boards and bank corporation in Republic China. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to be here to present my paper. Thanks for the organization, Florian. So. Uh, I guess started at six thirty in the morning. Haven't <laughs> get up so early <laughs> since two years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so for the paper, uh, I think I should share the screen, right? Yep. Uh, just give me. Uh, okay. This, this yep. one. That works fine. Okay. Yep. So, are you seeing the slides? Yes, I can see the slides. Okay, okay. Okay, that's my paper. So that's a joint work with my student and colleague. Um, in this paper, we wanna take a look at the culture identity or culture issues uh, and their impacts on the corporate uh, corporations. So the culture, uh, the culture issues is very big questions. So there's a lot of literature to discuss this, uh, particular for modern societies. But there is uh, some uh, uh, disadvantages uh, when you use uh, today's society as a context. On the context, because uh, you know the difficulty is the identity identification issues um, and the other factors combining them together. Therefore, we wanna in this paper we want to answer this general bigger questions, but use a, a historical context. Uh, that's the idea of this paper and motivation. Uh, before we move to our uh, content, 
uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, the framework we have, uh, the foundation of this paper. So when we look at the institution and, uh, and informal institutions, uh, you know, in the literatures, uh, we classify this, we take a look at it from different perspective. So for formal institutions, for example, the political, legal, religions, regulations, uh, that's the regulations we need to obey. So we need, it's compulsory for everyone. Therefore, in the literature, it, it, it is called a uh, rule of the game. So a change is compulsory and they will change your behavior. Uh, it's basically change your payoff and further change your people's behavior. Um, there's a lot of famous papers around the Asimov Blues 2020, uh, 2001. Uh, you name it. And for informal uh, institutions, uh, particularly for cultures, and the culture will change people's trust, values, and beliefs. They basically manipulate your um, like preference in the language of economics and change your uh, preference and further change your behavior. So, um, you know, I get started uh, uh, with my career in China since two years. Um, I think um, culture uh, factor, um, it's very important factor. So although the formal institutions also very, has a huge impact, but you can't, you can't ignore the culture and other informal institution, particularly in an environment where uh, we have, you know, uh, Eastern culture environment. So um, I'll give you some examples later on. Uh, okay, um, that's the motivation of our paper. I'm very interested in the factor. And I wanna say if this uh, uh, factor have impact on human behavior uh, empirically and in the literatures, we talk about every day, uh, but you can't rule out uh, the inst formal institutions from a culture uh, factor. Uh, Therefore, uh, we focus on this paper. Okay, so the next uh, uh, slides uh, about, okay, the, uh, the mixed result in cultural economics and in the literature because the difficulty of the identification issues uh, in the literature, there's the, 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 the result is still ambiguous. Some people use the different data delivers to different uh, effects. Uh, so that's our study come into play. So we want to put this question in a scenario, in a historical scenario where the formal institution was very weak and we, we focus on people's behavior, uh, purely rely on the informal institutions and see how it goes. Um, so therefore we focus on the Chinese modern bank industry. I think this picture is more clear to illustrate my idea. Um, okay, so before the war outbreak be between Japan and China in 1937, there's a three period. The first is the empire, empire dynasty. So the, the empire uh, collapsed in 1912 and then uh, a military regime take over the dominance of China and, uh, and uh, uh, their capital located in Beijing because the, their capital located in Beijing in the north part of China. Therefore, uh, this regime is also called the Beijing regime, the north and north regime. And, uh, um, and expectedly, the military of the so-called the KMT nationalist uh, government uh, win the war between the military regime and the nationalist the KMT and take over the military regimes uh, and start uh, start another uh, government start another uh, government in uh, Nanjing. That's a city, capital city of KMT government uh, because Nanjing is uh, around the area of Shanghai. So it's in the south part. Therefore, we also, it is also called the Nanjing decades. That's 10 years. And then, then uh, by 1937, 
the war outbreak is Chinese version of World War II. So therefore we, our study just stopped by 1937. So basically our study is basic, basically, sorry about my dog. <laughs> Have you seen it? Okay, so <laughs> apologize for that. Okay, so, uh, can you see my mouse? Yes, yes. Okay, that's good. That's good. I can ping out. Okay. So basically, we focus on these two periods where the formal institution was very big. So, um, and then the bankers or businessmen have had to rely on the informal institutions. That's our conjecture. So when we look at the archives and look at the diary of those people, we found that that is the consistent. So because uh, they can't rely on the uh, formal institutions, you know, the, they even don't have a, uh, uh, they even didn't have a formal uh, government. Uh, therefore, they need to rely on some culture uh, factors that uh, can enhance the trust level. So we look at the diaries and found this is consistent. Indeed, they found they intensively looking some identity or culture factor that they can use to facilitate the corporations and the business transactions. So that's the, also the empirical foundation or the real foundation of our paper. That's, that's a question. That's, a, you know, that's a big question at that time. Not a minor questions that we use uh, some, uh, some econometrics technique to rule out. So that's the reason that we use this uh, as a context to, to answer our uh, uh, culture question. So uh, related to the merchant groups or so-called the MGs in China. So that's also a very important phenomenon, uh, culture phenomenon in China. So merchant, uh, the businessman, businessman looking for identity. Even today, they still, you know, the, they still uh, use this identity to get together and to conduct a uh, business. But at that time, so merchants groups in China was very strong, impacts very strong. So what is merchant groups? It's a little similar like uh, the European, uh, uh, GLEED. It's a, it's a similar like the GLEED, but I don't use that word because um, when you talk about the GLEED, you refers to an organization. Um, it's not compulsory to join. To join. So you, can, you are free to join the organization or not, or you can at the same time you join, at a, you, you join different uh, GLEED at the same time or uh, simultaneously. But uh, when we talk about the maturing, uh, merchant groups, that's uh, identity. So people are born to belong uh, to the uh, certain merchant groups because the, the, uh, the merchants of the MG is based on the same birthplace or belong to the same clients. So it's more like an identity. You can't choose that uh, as, uh, you can't choose that uh, identity. So. Therefore, I use this mer merchant group uh, to, uh, to, to reflect the culture identity uh, in my study. Um, does it really matter? That another question, related question is that, does it a uh, merchant groups really matters? If they share the same social grounds, are they real ma really matters? The social, social uh, when I talk about the social uh, ground, I mean, they share the same com uh, conducted code or share some values like Confucius. So that's, they share the same social ground and values. But uh, if you look at the, the literatures on Chinese merchant groups in Chinese, there's a lot of literatures. Uh, although in the English world, there's a limited li literatures related on the merchant groups, but in China, uh, in Chinese, there's a, there are a lot of literatures on that. So that's a group, uh, that's a table that, that uh, divided the culture values, the very 
abstract concept into some specific culture values, dimensions of culture values. You can see the concept of culture can further divide it into six dimensions, uh, like the government, firm relations, client-oriented values, social care, um, and openness, uh, and exploration spirit. Um, that's the major here is the major uh, business groups or merchant groups in China. You can see the numbers. If you give the numbers for different values for different groups, and you can see the number, the variation is significant. So they are not the same. For example, if you look at the innovation, attitude of innovation towards innovation, you can see the here, the gene, the gene group uh, has a lower values, but uh, at the same time, the draw uh, groups has a very much higher level uh, levels of these uh, attitudes. So that's uh, the uh, background of the merchant groups uh, in China. So move to our empirical study. That's the very simple uh, framework we used. The major uh, independent variable is the culture difference between bank I and G at time T. And the corporation uh, here, the independent, uh, the dependent variable is corporations between two banks at a time T. And here we have some pair uh, level controls and fixed effects. That's the, uh, uh, the major, uh, the principal uh, framework we used, uh, the model we used in the empirical uh, study. So here the data, so the data comprised of different levels. First, the bank level data are um, all the manual click, all are manual collected uh, uh, from the archives and the secondary documents. So there include some prep, uh, uh, performance data, a board compensation of banks um, and other other uh, names of directors or uh, and other briefing introductions. So these are uh, some secondary and first uh, uh, first hand uh, materials we used uh, from to collect this data. And uh, another highlight, uh, another data is direct level data is also the highlight of our paper is direct level data. So direct level data, we, we rely on uh, directors' background information to match to their, uh, to match their different, uh, to match their background to uh, different um, merchant groups. So therefore we need to collect the background data before 100 years ago for all the directors. That's, uh, that's a big work. That's a big work. Therefore, we are trying very hard to collect the data since I was a PhD student. Um, so that's, uh, and the data source is, com is very uh, diverse uh, from publications, biographies, diaries, archives, and uh, uh, genealogy, uh, uh, you name it, a very lot, a lot uh, very, uh, uh, it's it's very extensive uh, data source we have, and finally we end up. I think if I remember correctly, it'd be over seven hundred directors' uh, uh, bio, uh, background information in our data set. Uh, therefore, use this data, we can match their backgrounds to the uh, to different uh, to different merchant groups and to conduct our empirical study. And other, uh, another interesting uh, data source we need to mention is the measure on culture difference. So uh, if we start to compare the culture difference, we need um, taxonomy, taxonomy or cl classification of the uh, different culture, uh, uh, different merchant groups. Okay, uh, and the uh, very important uh, document we use at the starting point is this one. As you can see, it's a Kano in uh, 1938. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's issued by the 
military intelligence of Jap of Japan is uh, uh, you know uh, in Japan um, because Japan uh, won the invasion in China, therefore they set up a, a military intelligence. Uh, they conduct a lot of uh, social survey, and this survey is very, you know, it's it's because it's used for military purpose, and therefore um, I think it's more reliable to uh, to uh, to to uh, to set up this uh, classification. Uh, okay, and this called in Chinese uh, in English is a research on the Jiangzhe clique. Uh, it's basically what it basically uh, does. It uh, conduct a survey on the uh, merchant groups in Shanghai and the, the related regions, um, a particular in the financial sector, and we use this as a starting point to classic to 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 establish this classification of merchant groups. Okay, so as you can see. Okay, that's the same picture. Um, as you can see, we um, propose and the third tier and the three tiers uh, classification of the merchant groups. And the first, uh, we proposed and the three uh, big clients in uh, in the financial world in China. So the first, uh, the biggest one is Jiangzhe Jiangsu Click. It's, lo it's location around Shanghai because at that time, Shanghai was the financial hub and the people living around there is the biggest client or business group at, uh, at that region. And that, that's the super group we have, the first super group we have. And then we have Guangdong Click and others. And then we put the second tier of this merchant group is uh, some small uh, some small uh, classification or small groups proposed by that uh, by the recent literatures on merchant groups. And then we have the third tier or which we call the sub subgroup of uh, those merchant groups. And then we end up um, merchant group classification over 40 small, uh, small uh, business groups and they use this uh, classification we can compare the P and the Q uh, that refers the directors from the individual directors from different board uh, to compare their uh, uh, culture difference, uh, culture difference uh, times the weight. Uh, that's quite, uh, we, need, uh, we give, a rate, uh, give a weight here because it's quite quantitative. If two, uh, if two CEOs uh, of bank pair belong to the same uh, same merchant group, uh, the possibility to conduct this cooperation would be higher than to than the case of between two uh, regular directors. Therefore, we put a weight based on their positions, and then we aggregate uh, this director level information into some into the uh, into the uh, bank level and then we end up with a culture difference between two banks and that's the uh, independent variables we have uh, here in the empirical model uh, okay so just for uh, just in case you you can't follow my uh, my idea so here is uh, agro uh, is algorithm uh, to compare the culture difference between two directors. And the first, we, we, we compare the subgroup and if their subgroup are consistent, and then we plus this uh, uh, culture difference, we, we plus this one. And then we, we compare the groups or ordinary groups. And then if they, they are the same, uh, we uh, plus two, the number with plus two, and then we compare the subgroups and uh, if they all the same and we plus three. Therefore, uh, the culture difference varies from the maximum value of six to zero. Zero is the completely different. And six is they are, the, uh, they are completely uh, the same. So uh, that's our... Uh, independent variable. And then we move to the dependent variable of corporations. Corporations, we use two proxies uh, to reflect the corporations. 
Uh, the first one is interlocking directories. If you're familiar with the management and inter, uh, literatures, there's a lot of uh, literatures talk about the, the interlock directories as a proxy or for cooperation. And the second one is, 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 a, is a special one is a long syndicate. Long syndicate means um, uh, the bank, uh, um, let me talk a little bit about the background. At that time, so over 50, on average, over 50% of the income actually, actually come from the government related business. Uh, for example, like the bond speculations or, or government department related loan. Um, but um, the attitude of bankers towards the, the government business a little mixed because for individual bank, they're very small. They're very small. They need to get together to bargaining with the government. The government was very strong at that, that time. Therefore, they need to form a long syndicate uh, to uh, conduct the business with uh, uh, the government. Therefore, uh, from this perspective, I think loan syndicate, uh, uh, it's uh, another proxy uh, in the Chinese characteristics and it, 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 ca it can capture the uh, corporations at that time for bank banks. Uh, so- you, uh, you have about five minutes. Five minutes, okay. okay. So um, I think the background information is very necessary to deliver and then I give you some uh, empirical result. As you can see here, I can zoom in here. Um, the coefficients we are interested uh, is the culture difference here, uh, hit the coefficients. And optically, you can see all the coefficients is uh, statistically significant. Uh, and it's negatively uh, correl correlated with corporations, uh, which means uh, if the culture difference is bigger and the culture identity is small, um, they will have impact on the extent to which their two banks are co cooperated with each other. And what I wanna say is the column three and four. Column three is with all controls, a very, um, uh, interesting control is here, geography distance. Here, uh, our referee says that you need to demonstrate your story is a culture story rather than a distance story, geographical distance story. Therefore, we add some controls to rule out these possibilities. Uh, and here overlapping branches is also works for this purpose. And then we have, uh, uh, we have a control of the common uh, experience of the study because uh, at that time, culture relationship between two banks is not, was, not the only, was not the unique uh, social connections between two banks. Therefore, we form another one to control other uh, other uh, social connections with the two banks. And then you can see all the coefficients is uh, consistently. And then we use uh, I ways to, um, I ways instrument variables to, uh, uh, to talk about, uh, to discuss the endogeneity um, uh, due to the time limitation. I, I think I can't uh, finish that part uh, but later on, after the reference, uh, after the conference, if you're interested in that, uh, we're happy. I'm happy to talk uh, with you about this one. And uh, the last part or very interesting one I want to mention is the further test. The further, further test uh, 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 into the culture dim dimensions. Uh, as a talk, uh, by now, we only talk about the casual. Uh, relationship between the culture difference and the cooperation, but within it, which factor has a real impact on the cooperation is a still a black box. We haven't talked about 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 the mechanism of resilience about the channel, so therefore we conduct further investigations. Uh, I think you still remember this table. So in the background section, we decomposed uh, in the literature. Uh, the cultural values are uh, 
decompose, uh, decompose, uh, decomposed into different dimensions. We use those dimensions uh, to further uh, look at which dimensions have contributed to the inter uh, cooperation, uh, uh, the intergroup corporations. Uh, so what I did, uh, what I did is, is we differentiate the concept of business culture, business culture into three dimensions. Uh, the first is cultural values and trust and openness, according to that table and the related literature. And then we subsample all the bank pairs we use in the main regressions. Uh, 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 with their cultural difference with the upper 30% percentile, which means um, the bank pairs which uh, faced a serious uh, culture integration issues, they are totally different. So they are faced as culture issues. And we regress these values uh, in, this, uh, in this samples to the uh, cooperation uh, variables and say, which dimensions actually contribute to the intergroup corporations. Uh, we expect that clan values should have a negative on the corporations. Why is this? Because uh, clan values actually focus on their own big family. They only want to interact with each other within these clients. Therefore, for inter client corporations, I think this value, we expect that this value should be negative, but unfortunately we don't uh, have this uh, result. But, uh, but luckily, so this coefficient is uh, not significant. Uh, so which means uh, this values uh, has, don't have any impact on the, in, uh, into, uh, on the uh, corporations, uh, uh, but trust and the openness, these dimensions have a positive, uh, positive uh, impact on the uh, corporations, according to this third and third, uh, uh, the, the second and the third column of the regression table. So, which means uh, to conclusion, uh, which means uh, uh, this trust and openness spirit are some values embedded in the culture concept that actually contributed to the intergroup cooperation. So jump to the conclusion. Uh, uh, so use a historical context. We further investigated the culture impact on the corporations. We found in that context where the formal institution was lacking. Uh, informal institute people rely on informal uh, institutions. Culture identity, culture identity, really play a very important uh, role at that time. At that time, and the corporate people cooperate based on their cultural identities, and the, the cultural relationship is further established. I think I'll finish here. Uh, okay. Yep. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, no um, so we might have a time for maybe one kind of like short question if anyone is, has uh, comments or um, questions. Anyone is? Okay. So maybe just kind of thing. So trying to get us the idea is like the how much how closely are aligned banks with with groups. So is a bank can be a bank essentially in multiple groups, or is bank is banks are always associated with one single merchant group? Uh, actually, bank are associated with multiple merchant groups at that time. But uh, the more the better, because uh, if they are more diverse, the board diversity is. Uh, the board uh, culturally more diverse, they have more po possibility to integrate it with other banks because you know there's many peoples in this uh, with different background that can integrate it with the other banks. So that's our idea. Okay. Uh, cool. In most cases, uh, in our simple big banks or principal banks have uh, multiple uh, have directors with multiple backgrounds. Okay. And belong to this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you. I think we are 
given that we are running slightly over time here. Um, thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, maybe you can stop sharing. Um, yeah, okay. I think we, right. that finishes uh, the session. Uh, we've got then the next session starting, I think it's in Sydney time, 11.30, so in about, about 25 minutes. Um, and there will be a separate panel session. Um, the link again is in the program. So click there and you're gonna be joining. So uh, thanks again for everyone uh, joining and see you in 20 minutes, half an hour. Have a break or breakfast uh, in the meantime.